This video on church finances I thought was timely. There's been a lot of media stories about church finances and I wanted to address some of these things that have been talked about. First of all, I want to share, there's a book that was just recently released by D. Michael Quinn, uh, The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth, and Corporate Power. Uh, tremendous resources in here. It's a fascinating book. D. Michael Quinn is actually not a member of the church. Um, in an interview that he did with the Salt Lake Tribune, I want to share a quote from that. Uh, he said here, the church launched in 1830 in upstate New York with six members, counts nearly 16 million members worldwide, and then untold billions in assets. It wasn't always so. At one point, the federal government confiscated all its properties, withholding them for nearly a decade. Thereafter, the Utah-based faith endured cycles of near bankruptcy every 20 to 30 years until it finally found its economic footing in the 1960s. No matter the precise bottom line, these figures represent an astonishing accomplishment. It is an American success story without parallel. No institution, no church, no business, no nonprofit organization in America has had this kind of history. Now, a little bit on the uh, history, or some background of what he was talking about. Uh, Two, the last real crisis in the church came in, in 1963. Um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, the church was saving quite a bit of, of their income, but coming out of the, the Great Depression, uh, they were quite fearful and were keeping the money, uh, the, the, the reserves that had been saved um, in cash in the banks and not investing uh, the funds. Then uh, they went on a, essentially a building uh, spending spree in the late 50s from 58 to 62, 63, um, used up all the reserve, in fact, went into debt. Today it would have been $2010, uh, Quinn points out, uh, about $236 million in debt. At that point, and in 1963, they even feared being able to make the payroll for the employees, the paid employees, um, in the church office buildings. Um, so it was, it was a very uh, challenging time. And Eldon Tanner uh, came in, a very sharp businessman, understood a lot about corporate finance, helped to develop policies and procedures, and also introduced sophisticated uh, wealth management uh, techniques used by the Harvard Endowment Fund as an example, or the Ford Foundation, a lot of these sophisticated institutional money management processes that have been used now for decades in the church. Um, this did help turn the, the church around, and uh, to give you an example, if you were to have invested in the stock market in 1975, $1 million in 1975 today would be worth $228 million. That's the growth that would have happened there. And we did get back in the black on the reserves um, in the 67, 68 uh, period. Uh, so the reserves were being restored at that point. Now, if you look at uh, today, one of the huge stories that came out in June uh, was, was broke by a group with the Mormon leaks that put out, and it's, it's all over the place now that, uh, online, uh, that the church has a $32 billion stock portfolio. And I could get into the details of how they came up with this. They cobbled it together with different things, and you could question some of the results for various reasons. But I think if you just set it on the face of it, let's say they had $32 billion. Well, based on the math I just said, if you went back to 1975, um, that would actually be $228 million invested then, would be $32 billion today. Bishop Kaze of the presiding bishopric shared a quote um, recently uh, in a symposium, Church History Symposium, in March of 2018. He says, the church also methodically follows the practice of set up, setting aside a portion of its resources each year to prepare for any possible future needs. The money set aside are then added to the investment reserves of the church. They are invested in stocks and bonds, majority interest in taxable businesses, some of which date to the church's early Utah history, commercial, industrial, and residential property. And I'll take a minute to add uh, the City Creek Center uh, there's a lot of controversy of that. $1.5 billion, that was part of this portfolio and diversification. And why not? Why wouldn't you do that across from Temple Square uh, as part of your portfolio of assets? Uh, I think it's a very strategic uh, decision, but it was people looking at that. There wasn't any tithing funds used. This was part of the reserves uh, there to, to build that, and it's part of the investment portfolio. Um, and he goes on to say agricultural interests, uh, the church's reserves are managed by a professional group of employees and outside advisors. Risks are diversified, consistent with wise and prudent stewardship and modern investment management principles. 
In the parable of the talents, the Lord who asked for an accounting from his servants chastised the one who had not invested the money entrusted to him, but instead had hid that money in the earth. He characterized the servant as wicked and slothful for not investing that money for a reasonable financial return. Consistent with this spiritual principle, the church's financial reserves are not left idle in non-productive bank accounts, but are instead employed where they can produce a return. These invested funds can be accessed in times of hardship to ensure the ongoing, uninterrupted work of the church's mission, programs, and operations, and to meet emergency financial needs. The funds are also needed to provide additional financial resources to support the church's mission to prepare for the Lord's second coming. They will help all nations of the earth. We anticipate that a large part of this growth will take place in the developing and populous nations of the world. Ever-increasing financial means will be required to provide thousands of meeting houses, additional temples, and other essential resources to bless members' lives wherever they are. In short, all these funds exist for no other reason than to support the church's divinely appointed mission. So the church is build, actually building a new building somewhere in the world every day. That's the, the average. Um, and to give you an idea also, Quinn's book was great on some details of this. Uh, if you were to look at the nations of the earth, um, the United States is the only area that is self-sustaining where the tithing receipts are able to cover the expenses for operating the church. Uh, I should say there's one exception, Canada. It goes in and out a little bit, but it's, it is self-sustaining. But to give you one example, the United Kingdom, the UK, on average gets a 40 to 60 percent supplement from church headquarters so because their tithing there in the UK is not enough to overcome the expenses of operating the church there. Um, and to give you one dramatic example, in 2006 the church sent the United Kingdom $450 million in that one year. This is a developed country. It was the first one the church was in, uh, 1837. Uh, one, one of the first ones that the church was in. Also, if you look at where the church is growing dramatically, Africa, uh, the Philippines, uh, and over 90% uh, being supplemented from church headquarters. So these funds are extremely important and needed, especially for the future. And that's also where this becomes a very critical thing in, in trying to, de to develop what is being done and, and how to allocate it. There's some challenges that are sometimes presented with uh, it, is the church doing enough from, from a humanitarian perspective, especially with these, these kind of dollars? And I think they're trying to um, also be cautious in, in um, not doing their alms before men, but also letting their light shine and finding, finding the right balance. And there has been some statements that have been uh, confusing about amounts that have been said. There was recently um, a comment that was made uh, on the Mormon newsroom site, it says the church has spent billions of dollars over the past few years to meet welfare and humanitarian needs around the world. We anticipate that these needs will continue to increase over time. Church-affiliated for-profit ent entities also contribute to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Foundation, which gives to various charitable causes. So the brethren, through Revelation, were told that to, the, the Council on the Disposition of the Tithes, which is the First Presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and the presiding bishopric uh, are to seek revelation on how to use these funds for the church. And so they do seek revelation and try and guide both now and into the future, but particularly being aware of these uh, massive uh, uh, costs that could be coming down the road. Remember, every time that the church builds a building or a temple, it's not an income producing property, it's an income using uh, property and we future costs to the, to the church. Also, in Michael Quinn's book, he did an estimate on maybe the tithing funds that are being brought into the church. It may sound dramatic from some of the analysis that he's pulled together. Um, there's lots of assumptions that are used. I take this with a big grain of salt, but he came up with a, a number of $33 billion a year, and then maybe another 15 to 17 billion from the portfolio uh, of the church as well that, that uh, provides the resources for the operating of, of the church. Um, some others have done analysis that are show numbers less than half that and have some good assumptions associated with those too. So it's hard to know there. Those are huge numbers, but again, remember some of the numbers I just shared with you. Also, to give you an example, The Economist uh, several years ago talked about the operating budget of the Catholic Church just in the United States was $170 billion a year to just give a frame of reference of, of the operation. 
There is a powerful concept, though, of the lay ministry of the church. And if you think about it, on the local level, all of the services done by all these bishops, stake presidents, all the leaders, no one's paid. And all of those dollars that would, for, for other churches, that, that's a cost and expense, that has also helped to lead to where we are today with this large growth in the assets that can be used for the furthering of the growth of the, of the church. Okay, some have complained about transparency uh, as well. The church does not publish financial reports. It does in certain countries where it's required to. Here is a piece on the LDS.org site about this. It says, the church is not a financial institution or a commercial corporation. It has no other objective than preaching the gospel and inviting all to come into Christ. While the church chooses not to publish the details of its finances, the church does provide public information on the financial principles it follows, the financial controls in place to protect church funds, and the source and use of these funds. The church also provides all financial information required by law. Now, I will say, I, I kind of wish they would publish it. I think it would be phenomenal. But I understand there's probably an aspect to this of the micromanaging and the criticisms that could come with people that probably have one one hundredth of the information of those that were making the decisions and that were also seeking inspiration from God about what to do. So I do understand that there are controls and processes in place. Um, here's a, a, a just, I'll just put it on the screen for a minute. Um, here you can pause the screen if you want to read about the Council on the Disposition of the Ties and the principles they follow, as well as Bishop Kaze's breakdown of this church spending into the six major areas out there. Now, another controversial thing that's come about recently has been discussions uh, online, particularly about the living allowances that general authorities receive. Uh, I will t talk, first of all, just about scri the scriptural basis for this. If you look in uh, the New both the New Testament and the Doctrine and Covenants, Luke 10, 7, And in the same hour remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. DNC 70, verse 12. He who is appointed to administer spiritual things, the same is worthy of his hire, even as those who are appointed to a stewardship to administer in temporal things. Now, I know there's some concern with um, the concept of priestcraft um, when it comes to, to receiving any compensation in the church. Um, I'd like to share, uh, and remember, these general authorities are not uh, seeking a career path here. They, they have been asked to do this. They're called to do this. Uh, same thing with mission presidents. They're, they're asked to do this. Um, and if you, I, I'd like to read this from the Fair Mormon website on addressing this question of priestcraft. On here, it says, Church members have a particular sensitivity to issues surrounding paid ministries, particularly due to admonitions in the Book of Mormon relative to a practice known as priestcraft, which is, quote, that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. And then it's, this is repeated um, multiple times in the Book of Mormon. For this reason, the idea of compensation for service seems contradictory to strongly held values of the Latter-day Saint community. However, it should be noted that priestcraft as it has been defined is a con condemnation of intent to get gain and praise and not for the welfare of Zion, and not about individual receiving support. Living stipends are not compensations for service, but recognition of a practice, a practical reality that individuals who decide to dedicate their full time to church service are sometimes unable to simultaneously provide for their own modest living needs. The example of King Benjamin adds to the LDS value of self-sufficiency of leaders in particular. Benjamin while King still labored for his own support. This is a very admirable demonstration of humility on the part of the King. However, this example was being used in the context of his political position as King and would be comparable to a president refusing to accept his salary for his service which we've had three presidents in the U.S., uh, Hoover, Kennedy, and Trump, uh, that did this. It should not be used to condemn the practice of helping provide for the modest living needs of full-time leaders who are unable to dedicate time to earning a living. Now, there are some examples out there of uh, uh, getting rich off the people, in a sense, from religion. Here is an example of the top ten richest pastors in the world and their, their net worth. Put up on the screen there. Uh, Kenneth Copeland's 760 million net worth. Bishop T.J. Jakes, 150 million. You can see these names. Pat Robertson, 100 million. Joel Olstein, many know him, 40 million. Billy Graham, 25 million. Rick Warren, uh, the Saddleback Church there um, in Lake Forest, California, 25 million. 
Uh, these are some examples. And again, we talked about the, the lay ministry uh, at, the, at the local levels are all volunteer uh, service um, there. And that's part of the reason why the church has been able to grow so much. Also, if the church did not provide a living allowance for these general authorities or uh, the uh, modest uh, living uh, allowance for the mission presidents, then only the wealthy could serve. Uh, they, nobody else would, would be able to uh, logistically. So it gives, gives the ability to call anyone to those positions. Uh, also, this has not uh, been hidden. Um, uh, President Hinckley uh, said in general conference, uh, the living allowances given the general authorities, which are very modest in comparison with executive compensation in industry and the professions, come from the business income of the church and not from the tithing of the people. Then uh, the ensign talked about um, uh, mission presidents as they put their lives on hold, uh, can often go through a uh, uh, challenging financial situation with that, and they are provided with a minimal living allowance uh, because of that circumstance as well. Um, the dollar amount uh, that was recently disclosed uh, online on, on this also causing controversy, 120000 If you were to compare that to the CEO of the Red Cross as an example, it's 10 times that. It's $1.2 million for the CEO of the Red Cross. If you were to look at the highest paid church employee, full-time paid employee, running the admir uh, administration or the, the bureaucracy side of the church um, up in Canada, because they do have to disclose that up there, 250000 is the top pay, so twice the amount of the general authority. And keep in mind, too, the general authorities are all getting paid the same. Um, the, the profit down to the newest called uh, general authority um, all receive that same uh, dollar amount. So the only additional income uh, sources that the general authorities could actually get, especially the 12 and the first presidency that are called for life, would be uh, books, book royalties. And so you might think that might be a decent amount. It's, it's not. It's very, very minimal. A, a great example that Quinn put in here, the most prolific general authority writer, probably uh, dozens of books, Joseph Fielding Smith. When he died in probate, they looked at his uh, last royalty check and annualized it and figured it out. In today's dollars, it would have been less than $50,000. Uh, and again, with, with dozens of books um, that had been produced. And of course, I will say, in the Doctrine and Covenants, we're told the Lord will hasten his work in his time. These resources are critical towards that measure, and I believe personally that that's part of why this is happening now. And it's told that he will do it in his own way, and it's wonderful to watch and see where the church is going. Hopefully this uh, is a helpful video on the topic. Subscribe for more.